So today we are continuing with our series called Peace Within. Um, and we are discovering how do we find peace. We're on this quest uh, of finding peace. Now one of the things that can steal our peace so easily are times of suffering or times of pain. Um, and this is something maybe you are experiencing in this season of your life. And so the question is, can we find peace in a time of pain? Now, I think for most people, we make the assumption that, that peace and pain are actually mutually exclusive. Uh, you, you can't have peace while you are experiencing pain, right? I think that's the assumption that we make, but that would be wrong. Uh, that would be like saying that you cannot find warmth in the season of winter. Uh, I'm willing to argue that the best kind of warmth that you can find is exactly in the season of winter. Um, it is in that contrast that we find this beautiful warmth. I mean, just imagine uh, yourself on a very cold day. The only thing you can think about is a nice fireplace, having some hot chocolate sitting next to uh, what, someone you love under a blanket um, and enjoying a, 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 a beautiful piece of warmth in a season of winter. Now, in the same way, I believe that the best kind of peace that a person can experience is the kind that you experience in your times of pain and suffering. There's this beautiful contrast of, of peace and pain, that these two words are actually not mutually exclusive, they are actually complementary to one another. Now, another thing about pain that we have to understand from, from the get-go is that the Bible never promises us a way around pain. The Bible, Jesus never made a claim that he is going to take us out of this world that we don't experience pain now. While we are still walking this earth, pain remains a reality. Uh, last week we spoke about John 16 verse 33 where Jesus says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So Jesus making a promise, he's reminding us, look, Pain is going to be a reality in this world. But in me, you may have peace. But that in me, you may have peace. So what Jesus is actually promising is not a peace that comes from the circumstances of this world. Not a peace that comes from the absence of pain. So Jesus' promise when it comes to peace is not a promise that, look, I'm going to take pain out of your life so that when there is an absence of pain, pain, then you will experience peace. Jesus says, I'm going to give you my peace. Even in a lifetime of trouble, you will experience my peace. Now, it's very important for us to understand that the Bible never claims that the chief goal of life is happiness. The Bible's claim is that the goal of life is actually glorifying God. Now, in this uh, humanistic world that we live in, we're living in a worldview that is centered around the self and, and sort of the pursuit of happiness. And so sometimes we struggle. If that is your worldview, you struggle with the idea of pain uh, because you, you can't come to grips with it because pain is standing in the way of your happiness or your personal fulfillment. Um, and if happiness is the chief goal of life, then pain is a problem. But if the chief goal of life is glorifying God, then pain is no longer a problem, but pain becomes an opportunity. It becomes an opportunity to glorify God. Now, if you just think for a moment about the cross. Uh, the cross is probably the most, like, the, the well, most well-known symbol in the world. Now, if you look at a cross, it symbolizes pain. It is the symbol of pain, and not only physical pain, Jesus hanging on the cross. It actually symbolizes the worst kind of pain that imaginable to humanity. The day when humanity killed their own creator. When, when humans decided to kill the one that made them. That's the most painful thought. And so the cross is a symbol of pain and of death. Yet at the same time, the cross is the symbol of God's glory. It is the symbol of the glory of Christ. There's this beautiful contrast that at the same time it is a symbol of pain and it's also a symbol of the glory of God. It is actually a symbol of peace. It is the symbol of peace between us and God. Jesus came to serve, not to be served, so that his life can be given for many to be a ransom, 
so that we can experience peace between us and our Creator once again. So the symbol of pain becomes a symbol of peace and of the glory of God. And so pain and peace are not mutually exclusive. They are actually complementary. And today we want to take some time to speak about this, this contrast that is the beauty of pain. The beauty of pain. Now I want to start off by speaking about the beauty of scars uh, or, or the glory of scars. Now, uh, one thing I know about men is that we love scars. Uh, I think ladies also love them. Um, but we love it when, when someone has a bit of scars, maybe someone that you know, plays a contact sport or something like that. I remember when I grew up, my, my dad was my hero. Uh, he's still my hero. But I remember when I was a, you know, a young boy, I, I used to envy my dad. And what I loved most about my dad, what I found most attractive about my dad was his scars. I mean, he grew up on the farm. He played rugby. Uh, and then so he had lots and lots of scars on his body. And each scar was a story to be told. Um, I remember these wonderful stories telling me, telling me how like, he dislocated this shoulder and then that shoulder and then when he got which operation in his body. And, and what I loved most about you know, my dad was his cauliflower ears. Now, just for those who don't know rugby, a cauliflower ear is the, the, the ears that you find in the forwards. Uh, the, the rugby players, sometimes they've got these you know, ears that seems like they are messed up, but they're actually just beautiful scars of, of contact sport. They, uh, you know, they really just testify about um, the, the, what this person has actually gone through. Now, I love those ears of my dad. In fact, it was my dream to one day also have cauliflower ears. My only problem was that I was always put in the back line, and we don't do a lot of contact in the back line. You, you sort of try and avoid it and say, well, no, you're just stepping people, but you, you're just running away from, from contact. Um, and so, but, but there was this one you know, glorious day when someone hit me on the side of my head, and my ear was in between the two heads, and, and this right ear of mine got slightly deformed. Uh, unfortunately, you probably won't be able to see it on the camera, but, but there is a, a like, it's, it's, it's slightly deformed on the side of my ear. And I remember I was so proud of that, of that scar, because, you know, it was starting to look like my dad. Um, that's the thing about scar, they, they, scars. They actually speak about, about glory. I remember the other day I, I played, you know, uh, well, not the other day, a long time ago, I played a game of rugby and I was in the air and someone sort of tackled me in the air and I fell on the ground. I was out for a few seconds and they had to put stitches on my head. And I was like scared and excited at the same time while I was lying in the ambulance and they were doing the stitches. And in my mind, when I got out there, I looked like William Wallace from Braveheart, you know, blood over the face. Um, and I was so proud of those stitches. I remember getting home and uh, um, my sisters was there, were there, and Karin also, who's my wife now, they were there. And so I was so impressed, and I didn't say anything. I just walked in, started speaking about the game, how my night was, asking them how their evening was. And after about 20 minutes, they didn't say a word about my stitches on my head. And the problem was, when I looked in the mirror, is that there were only two stitches, and no one could see them. They were extremely small. It was really a small wound, and I didn't look like William Wallace at all. And when I finally told them, you know, I got stitches, you know, um, they didn't say, oh, shame, well, you're so brave. They just laughed at me because uh, I, I so badly wanted them to see those scars. And I so wish that, that I had more scars to, to show. Now, you might wonder, why am I speaking about scars so much? Scars tell a story. Now, let me ask you this. What scars do you have? Maybe you don't have physical scars, but you've got maybe emotional or spiritual scars. You've got certain battles that you've gone through in your past, and they've left this beautiful scar. And my question to you is, how are you wearing your scars? Are you proud of them? Are you, are you using them as a, a way of testifying about the glory of God, about how He's healed you? You see, a scar is a, a testimony, it's proof of healing that has taken place. But sometimes we go to great lengths to try and hide what has happened to us in the past. In actual fact, God actually wants you to brag with some of those scars. Now, the reason I'm saying that is because our Lord Jesus, He loved to show off His scars. I don't know if you ever saw this in the Bible, but it's, it's quite interesting that, that Jesus... Um, 
after he rose from the dead. So this is the resurrected Jesus. He rises from the dead, and in this resurrected body, he's got the power to walk through walls, right? He's just like moving around, and he's going to his disciples, and at one stage, he even walks through wall, through, through a wall to them. And so this resurrected body of him is capable to do many things. Now, obviously, a guy that could raise from the dead has got the power to heal his own scars, to do a bit of cosmetic surgery to himself to hide the scars. But quite interestingly, Jesus was so deliberate in keeping his scars. He goes to his disciples in Luke 24, and he tells them, peace be with you. Peace with you. So there's that word, peace. And then the next verse, he tells them, look at my scars. <laughs> he tells them, it's me. You can know it's me because look at my scars. You know what I've gone through. And so Jesus comes and shows his scars. And there's that beautiful story about, uh, about a week later. Thomas, didn't, he wasn't there. He didn't believe them. And he says, unless I put my finger in his hands and my hand in his side, and unless I see and touch his scars, I'm not going to believe that Jesus has rose from the dead. And Jesus allows him. Jesus shows up and he shows Thomas, look at my scars. And it's this beautiful testimony of what God has done. And so Jesus embraced his scars. And so my question to you, how are you wearing your scars? I love that story about Thomas, because it's the skeptic coming to Jesus saying, you know, I won't believe unless I see the scars. And then this skeptic is convinced because of the scars. Now, I think in the same way, there might be someone in your life. There might be people that God is going to send along your way. And the only way that they're going to be drawn closer to God is if they see your scars is if they see that the pain that they are busy going through is the same kind of pain that you have already gone through. And by, you know, not being ashamed of, of the scars and the things that you've gone through in your past, you can actually draw other people to God. God can use your pain tomorrow. You can use your scars to draw other people to Him. Now, the second thing that's really beautiful and why God has decided to keep the scars, I believe, is because that's the picture of who God is. You see, other, other religions and, and our expectation of a God would be that it's this, this perfect God that just avoids uh, suffering totally because he's too powerful. And he gives a promise to us that he will just take all the suffering or the stumbling blocks out of our way. But Jesus decides to reveal himself as a man with wounds because that's exactly who God is. God decided to become, to become flesh. In, in uh, John 1 verse 14, it says the word, so speaking about Jesus, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. You see, the God that we serve is the God that came to dwell among us, to live in this world of suffering and pain. And to experience that also, Matthew 1 verse 23, it says, The virgin will, give, will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. You see, when Jesus reveals himself with those scars, he is telling us that in our pain, he is with us. He knows what it feels like. He's able to sympathize. He is the God with us. His scars testify that he is the God that was willing to step into our world and to experience pain for us. Now, the promise that God makes is not a promise to take pain out of your life. He doesn't promise a way around pain. The promise that Jesus comes and makes is that he will meet you in your pain and also he'll be waiting for you on the other side of your pain. He gives us a way, a courage to go through our pain and not try and go around it. So maybe the prayer that you should be praying is not, God, take my pain away, but rather, God, give me courage to stand in my pain and to go through my pain. God, would you meet me in my pain? There's also some things that God can do in your pain that he cannot do in other seasons of your life. 
There are certain things that God can only do in your times of pain and suffering. My prayer for you today is that if you are going through a season of pain, is that this would be that time when God came so close to you that it changed your life. This could be a beautiful season of your life where God did certain things that he cannot do in other times. It could be that, you know, that winter warmth that you can feel at the fireplace that is so beautiful because of the contrast. It could be the peace that God brings you in your season of pain that is so memorable and also gives a story to tell to others. There's a beautiful quote from Erwin McManus from his book, The Way of the Warrior, that I want to share with you. And he's speaking about scars and, and wounds. The warrior bears their wounds well. Their scars carry a beauty that only sacrifice can create. The warrior never hides their scars. They know their scars are the story of their life. The one who has no wounds has never fought a battle. The warrior only trusts the person who bears wounds openly and wears them well. Some wounds are so deep they take years to heal. Others, other wounds are unseen and the healing takes a lifetime. The warrior knows that the battle will cause them great pain, anguish, and suffering. You do not, you do not go to war because you think you can avoid defeat. You don't go to war because you believe that the victory is certain. You go to war because you know you must fight. And so that leads me to the next point, is that we are called to stand in our pain. We are called to stand in our pain. If you are in a season of pain, you are called to stand in that pain. Probably one of the things I love most about rugby is, is that moment when a guy gets a blood injury and they take him off the field, he gets stitched up and he runs back on the field and he keeps on playing. When a person steps back into the ring, Remember for me, that was, you know, when I got those two stitches that wasn't so significant as I thought. And I thought I looked like William Wallace running back onto the field, ready to play again. In the meantime, no one even knew I got stitches. But there was something in that that, that I just, you know, told myself, there's no way that I'm going to stand on the sideline. I need to keep on playing. Even if I'm going to try and avoid co a contact by all means, you know, it's about honor in that moment. Now, I believe there's something honorable in standing in the pain. And if you think about Jesus, his greatest strength was shown in that moment of humility when he stood in the pain. We did not try and avoid it. He didn't try and run away from his season of pain. He stood in the pain. You know, something we forget sometimes is that Jesus actually prayed a prayer to the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane, saying, Father, may this cup pass from me. So, so he was asking God, God, is there no other way around this? Is there no other way? So Jesus was saying, God, I don't want to do this. This is too painful. But there was no way around it. And if there was no way around it for our Lord Jesus, but that was actually the thing that led to his greatest glory, it might just be the same thing for you and me in our season of pain. And so Jesus asked for a way around. The Father says, no, there's no way around this. And Jesus stands in the pain. Just think about this for a moment. Jesus gets betrayed. He gets arrested. He gets mocked by soldiers. He gets put in front of a, a religious uh, jury. They start saying blasphemous things about this God, Jesus. And then he gets put in front of uh, King Herod and, and Pilate. Um, and he gets condemned by the crowds. And people are shouting, crucify him, crucify him. And then he gets crucified. At any of those moments, Jesus could have, Jesus had the power to at any of those moments to just say, enough, I'm done. I'm done with you all. But he didn't. He stood in the pain. You see, the creator, the, the one, you just imagine this for a moment. The, the crowds that are shouting, crucifying, crucify him. The very breath that they are using to shout, crucify him, was given to them by him. The one, the creator that gave them the very breath that they are now shouting at him, crucify him. He could have just said, enough, I'm done with you all. But Jesus decided to stand in the pain and it led to the greatest glory that we've ever seen in this world. Now, 
Maybe for you, it's the same thing. Maybe you should stop wishing that your pain would just pass. Maybe peace, the greatest kind of peace that will be so memorable, the kind of peace that will change your life, Maybe that kind of peace is not around your pain, but it's actually going to be inside of your pain, inside of this season of pain in your life. And it's going to be on the other side of the season of pain. If the goal of life is to glorify God, then pain sets a beautiful scene for us to glorify God. It sets the perfect scene for us to bring glory to God. Now I want to close uh, these uh, two verses I want to share with you. The first is from Isaiah 9, verses 6 to 7. And so it's about this question. So, so what do we do now? In a season of pain, how do I respond? Where do I go? How do I find this peace? Now, what we need to understand is that peace is not something that Jesus gives us. He is peace. Peace is a person. It's not a thing that we find. It is a person. So you find it with Jesus. You run into Jesus. Isaiah 9 verse 6 and 7 says, For to us a child is born. And this was written 700 years before Jesus came onto the scene. It's a prophecy about who God is. To us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. You see, in this season of pain in your life, Know that you have got a wonderful counselor. He can give you counsel now. God is waiting for you in your pain. He's already there. He's got the scars to prove it. He's waiting for you. He's a wonderful counselor. In that moment, you know that you can pray to a mighty God. And you know that it doesn't matter what changes in your life. Nothing will change the fact that you've got an everlasting Father. And you've got a Prince of Peace. He is the Prince of Peace. If you run into Jesus, you will find peace. He is peace himself. John 14 verse 27, Jesus says the following, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. You see, the promise of the world is that you will find peace in the absence of pain. When life is good, then you'll have peace. It's in circumstances that the world promises us that we will find peace. It's in the absence or only after your pain that you'll find peace. Jesus says, no, I don't give like the world. I give you my peace. And so the answer for us is that you need to run into Jesus. Revelation 3 verse 20, Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock and whoever opens for me, I will come into him and we will feast together. You see, Jesus is the feast. And so if you run into Jesus, you will feast in that fellowship. And in the season of pain, you can experience fellowship with Jesus. And the more you look into the face of Jesus, the more you will experience peace. Run into Jesus. My prayer for you is that if you are in a season of pain right now, my prayer is that this moment will change you. That, you will, that this will be that season when, you've, when you experience God so closely that it changed you forever. That this moment that you're experiencing now, the pain of today, that it will become the most beautiful and most glorious scar of tomorrow. That you'll be able to testify that Jesus is, in fact, Emmanuel, God with us in my pain always. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we thank you that you are Emmanuel, God with us. And that I want to pray just for anyone, God, that is going through a season of pain right now, God. May they see you. May they see that you are there with them, that you know what it feels like to go through loneliness. You know what it feels like to go through physical pain. God, you know what it feels like to be separated from the one that you love, the Father. God, may you come and bring comfort to those who are going through pain in this moment. May you come be Emmanuel, God with us in that moment, God. I pray for courage for any person going through a season of pain now, God, that they would be able to stand in their pain and that their pain today would become a scar for tomorrow that will be a beautiful testimony that will also draw other men and women to you, Jesus.
Amen.